Ram head is threatening with an edge on his voice. The Carrig Lee is answering with his too big mouth. Oh, watch out, old sailor, at the mouth of the bay, and return to the harbour and stay in the shelter. The Ardmore Cliff Walk. Each generation has found a different purpose for the headland. For the monks, it was a place of solitude. In wartime, a place of observance. A place of hiding from the Brits and the Tans. And for our generation, a place to get away from the pandemic, for our minds to wander freely across the Atlantic. The earliest structure at the base of the path is Temple Dysert. The Irish word Dysert gives its name from the Latin desertum, meaning desert, place of solitude. From the 8th to the 10th century, where St. Declan and the monks lived away from the village, held as a holy place which brought people from the nearby townlands for prayer, drinking and fighting on St. Declan's feast day. Pilgrims entered the grounds of the hermitage and blessed themselves with water from the well. They would then circle the church three times in a clockwise motion, reciting the rosary and make the sign of the cross on the wall of the church. As story goes, they would catch the rock dust in their holy water and finish their rounds by drinking it, leaving it to enhance the water's cure. Word had it the headland was full of copper. Mr. Ferguson and Spargo had a go at mining it in 1920. Tools were forged and local men employed, located somewhere below the Coast Guard station towards the head. The ground was infertile with copper and the mine fizzled out after six months leaving debts unpaid and a hole to be filled. The sea can be merciless. The Samson was a crane barge being towed from Liverpool to Malta on the 9th of December 1987. It hit bad weather, snapping the tow line and ran aground at Ram's Head three days later on the 12th. 12 tons of toxic pollutants plus 800 gallons of diesel oil were removed from the barge. A local man named Jim Rooney lowered himself down to it by rope and stayed on it for 40 days to claim salvage rights. Food and changes of clothing were lowered to him regularly. I don't think he was successful in his claims. Three months later, the Minister of the Marine was questioned in the Oireachtas as to why the barge remained stranded on the head. The response was it was the owner's responsibility and I have no statutory powers to remove such wrecked vessels or to direct that they be removed. I should point out that the costs involved in wreck removal can be very great. In 2016, the jib of the crane fell into the sea. The vantage of Ardmore Head was of great utility during war times. Built during the Napoleonic era, between 1804 and 1806, it's a signal tower on Ram's Head. Built in response to the threat of invasion by the French, 81 towers lined the Irish coast to communicate to one another. Ardmore's sister towers laid in Knockadoon and the other in Balnamona, now the location of Minehead Lighthouse. The process of sending a message involved the raising and lowering of a large rectangular flag, a smaller blue pendant, and four black balls or hoops in various combinations. A similar lookout post, LOP-20, was built in front of it in 1940 to watch passing ships and mines flowing into the bay during World War II. Daily observance was maintained throughout the war. At Christmas time, the kids in the village called the lookout post from the post office to speak with one of the men as Santa. Another religious structure is Father O'Donnell's well. Built in 1928 by a Limerick man named J.P. Raleigh, with help from other local men. He believed the water from the spring to have helped cure his illness. Nobody knows for certain who Father O'Donnell was. 
perhaps a silenced priest who came here to read his office. Fenced off from the path is a tea flag, a red sandstone cliff flat where tea parties were held by the gentry in the 19th century. A place for Sinn Féin meetings before independence. A place for drinking and mucking about. Names have been carved into the cliff for centuries, marking their existence and time. This is an archive of the people of Ardmore that has been cut off from us under the guise of private property. Fergal Keane wrote an article for The Independent in 2011 on man's inalienable right to walk the coastline where his ancestors strode. He was witnessing the curtailment of the freedom to roam the lands he had as a child. The headland stretches for over another five kilometers past Gold Island to Whiting Bay. Ancestral paths that are blocked by wires and untraversed. Each headland and cove has been named by those before us. The oral culture of Ardmore is disappearing. It has been recorded by the work of Siobhan Lincoln and others. She tells a story of the goats that roamed the headland around Goat Island. They began eating a man's turnips, he had said, so he had the guards run wild trying to round them up. They arrested them, brought them to the pound, and the man was committed to shooting any that weren't claimed, ensuring they never made it onto his land again. Other countries have constitutional rights to roam the land you're on. Man cannot own the sea or a right to wander by it. Only half the cliff is walkable. The remainder is part of our heritage, our archive. Keane asks an important question. He wrote, are we an open-hearted people as a tourist literature likes to proclaim? Or are the new fences and blockages symptoms of a nation looking inwards once more? As a country that has spent some of the longest time in lockdown in the world, perhaps it's time we answer that question. <laughs>